Uh, for those who are new in the room, I'm Darrell Brown. I have the privilege of serving as superintendent of schools here in Berkeley ISD. And uh, we've got a good showing today. We certainly appreciate that. Our, our last meeting, if you were not able to be here, uh, we'll show you a, a website here in a minute that on our Berkeley uh, ISD website, we've got a, a link for leadership via ISD so you can go in and see the various presentations. So the last time we talked about the role of the superintendent and school board and some of the basic functions, and today we get into the core work. We'll talk about curriculum instruction and we get a, a look at some of the complexity uh, of the work and challenges we have. We'll dip into a little bit of the, the state accountability. We'll get very much in depth uh, with the state accountability testing next session in April. Uh, we'll touch on that a little bit today. So you get to hear from some of our members of our curriculum instruction team. Uh, just one introduction. Uh, I'm going to ask if uh, Randy Sumall would stand. Randy is our newest member of the cabinet. He's the Exec executive director of technology and new work last day last week. So, uh, Randy, welcome to our team. <laughs> Randy comes with a wealth of experience. He served uh, as the leader of uh, the Region Service Center 10 for several years over the technology department. Uh, he's got experience in uh, Capel ISD, Judson ISD, and San Antonio for a couple of years. So, uh, a lot of years experience in technology, and we're certainly glad to have him on board. Uh, if you are new to the group, uh, you will get the benefit of getting the other folks. But if you don't mind, if you were not able to be here last time, if you would just raise your hand, and I'll point at you. If you just stand, tell us who you are and what your connection is. In other words, if you're a uh, Academy of West Virgil parent, or just what's your connection, and like who asked you to be here? Just tell us what your connection is. So raise your hand if you're, you're Randy. We'll start with Stacy. My name is Stacy Jingles, and I missed last time, but um, Dr. Rick Kemp uh, suggested that I kind of be a part of this. I actually just have a two-year-old and one on the way, so I don't actually have an affiliation to some school, but my family and I moved to the district this summer, and so we will be future parents, and so just wanted to be involved and love learning about education systems. Great. Stacy, thank you. Welcome. Yes, ma'am. My name is Nina Kaufman and I went through mm -hmm. Halton High School. I have a my older 18 year old went to Halton High School through the whole BISC. And then my youngest one is in fourth grade at David E. Smith and the teachers and the principal there recommended that I attend and be able to learn a little bit more about the district and so forth. So I'm happy to be here. And I miss last week as well. Great. So last week. Thank you. Right. So, other good this time. I'm Angie Wilson, and I teach at Richmond Elementary School. And this is my first time teaching children in Richmond Elementary School. And I have been here for about three years. Um, I have a two-year-old and a one-year-old. Um, I have a two-year-old and a one-year-old. Yes, others said. I would like to last time. Yes, ma'am. My name is Laura Cohen. I'm also a bird parent. I have three children in the system, and the principal recommended I do this. Walker Peak Elementary. Right. Thank you. Welcome. Yes, others. Sir. I'm Jay Rose, um, representative of Burkeville High School. Mr. Wells asked me to be here for the, uh, for the series of talks. And I have a son in 11th grade at Burkeville, and another son that's an uh, 8th grader at Smithfield Middle School. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Any other people? Yes. Well, welcome. And uh, just understand that our, our intent here is just to, to better inform you of, of the work of the school district. That, that I've learned through my years of experience that sometimes even our most connected parents, parents who maybe at this time have an elementary child, a middle school child, and a high school child, they may be well connected in an area or two. In other words, for all your kids in band, uh, you're really involved as a parent, volunteer, district club. Sometimes you've got a really good handle on band. But there's just so much to know. And uh, we just feel like sometimes there's some misinformation floating around the district. There's just not pure uh, explanations of why things are. Because I, I promise you, sometimes the legislative uh, mandates that come out are well intended, but they're very challenging, and we're forced to do some things to follow up under the law. But sometimes, to a, to a lay person, goes, "Why are we doing that?" Well, there's often good reasons. Uh, occasionally, there's not, and we, we welcome that input. We, we always try to improve our system. But we just want to make sure that our public is informed. So that when it comes time to, to talk about bond elections or you know, our taxes or anything to, to, to do this work at the level we need to, we just want people to have the correct information. And, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, I have no issue with someone voting against a bond election if they're informed with the facts. 
But it does bother me when you hear things that are not true or people have perceptions. Because let's say in five years, our economy is turning around and home values are going up and it shows that, that, that we're collecting more taxes. There would be an assumption that you would think, oh, I, I'm, I'm not going to vote that bond election because the taxes are going up, the school district's getting more money. But what you understand is locally we collect more money, the state gives us less. And that's kind of a, oh. So a lot of people would vote against the bond election for that reason. Not understanding is the state plays that game with us. So uh, it's just interesting. You need to be on with the facts. That's our purpose for today. So we're going to start off with uh, Dr. Lane Ledbetter, and this is his swan song. Dr. Ledbetter uh, was named as the new superintendent of Rainham ISD. So uh, he, uh, he's been working hard, because I promised him if he didn't do well, I'll send an email to Graham. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, Dr. Ledbetter. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, this is uh, this has been an interesting morning to prepare for. Um, when Dr. Brown asked us to do this, within, and I guess I get to be the, the first one to do this from a division standpoint with the uh, associate superintendents and course technology. Uh, but when you, I guess last month or last time we met, I talked a little bit just briefly, four or five minutes about curriculum instruction, the division, uh, what all's involved in CNI. And I talked a lot about the different directors as far as our current technology, our fine arts, uh, instructional technology, curriculum, professional learning. We have directors for each one of those, those areas that we, uh, for our functions within the district. And I can assure you that probably each one of those directors could stand up in front of you for a full day and talk about what they do and what their job entails and what, uh, how they try to support and how they try to how serve our campuses and our teachers. So when you sit down and try to look at, okay, we've got about 45 minutes to talk, just kind of an overview of curriculum instruction, uh, that's a pretty tough task. And uh, so I, obviously I met with uh, Donna Solly and Margaret Miller, Miller, and I'll introduce them here in a minute, but they're gonna come up and do a portion of the presentation. Uh, and we tried to really focus today on something that would be somewhat hopefully meaningful to you, uh, not go into too much depth or detail, uh, but yet still provide you hopefully with one or two or three takeaways uh, that you can leave here today and understand a little bit about uh, what our teachers do and what they have to do in the classroom. And that's really what we try to focus on, uh, which is basically the teaching and learning process of curriculum and instruction. And uh, really what we try to do, what we try to focus on as far as guiding our decisions uh, at, the, at the district level within curriculum instruction is, you know, what is it that we want students to know and to be able to do? And then how do we know if they're doing what we want them to do and learning what we want them to learn? And then what do we do if, we, if they're not? I mean, that's really, in very general, simplistic terms, what we do. And our whole goal within curriculum instruction at the district level is to serve those campuses, to serve those teachers, and provide resources for them so that they can impact learning. Now, obviously, there's a lot more that goes into that. There's a lot of mandates that we have, a lot of things in the district and guidelines that we put in place. But that's really, ultimately, in simplistic terms, what we try to do. The uh, We've had a... Basically what we're going to talk about today is, is curriculum. We, we've had kind of a, 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 a theme the last couple of years about curriculum matters. Uh, really we've tried to focus on what we're teaching in the classroom. What is it that we want the students to learn and be able to do? And, and it's really two different meanings there. It's uh, obviously the curriculum matters. It is important, especially with the changing uh, accountability system, that what we teach is very important. It has to align uh, not only with our district tests, our classroom assessments, but ultimately with the new STAR assessment and EOCs, it has to align with that. So what we're teaching has to be aligned. Uh, and so that's, that's the curriculum matters piece. Also, curriculum matters mean that there's a lot of things involved in curriculum, all the matters of curriculum uh, that play into that. And so we're trying to become a little more focused on those areas with our teachers, with our principals, uh, trying to provide a little more training in that area. So, but to kind of start off with today, to kind of get you thinking a little bit, get you involved. I want to keep this as, as much as possible. I know the format really doesn't lend itself that well, but I want it to be as informal as possible. So if we're going through something and you have a question, you want to ask a question about something you've heard, feel free to do so. Uh, we can stop and take a moment to address those things as we go through it. Uh, but just to kind of get you talking here for just a moment, I want you to think of a time uh, when you had a profound learning experience. Now try to think back elementary, middle school, high school, a learning experience that you have, whether it's a concept, an activity, or something that you just remember from elementary school, middle school, and then think about why. 
Why is it that you remember that activity, that concept, or what you learned? We're going to take about three or four minutes. Just talk about it at your table, and each person uh, can share out just one, you know, one thing. And then at the end, after we've talked about it, I want you to kind of talk about what was it about that experience that, that today, why do you still remember that? So I'll give you about three or four minutes, and then we'll kind of we'll share out. We may have one person from each table kind of talk a little bit to the group. Good morning, John. Rita. Hi, Rita. Nice to see you too. Hi, Mark. Are you doing? Okay, so curriculum or? Sorry, I'm my blackberry, but what's the question? So what? It, it's the and I'm looking up here for the board. Well, I can think of one thing because I talked to my kids about this the other day, especially my sixth grader. And I'm old. It was so long time ago. When I was in third grade, I remember at my little country elementary school, we had to learn the multiplication table. You know, you draw out the grid, two times two, two times three, two times four, and you memorize them. And we were through the class. And, and you got good at them. Yeah. <laughs> and you knew them because if you didn't, you got a board across your backside. They spanked back then <laughs> for not learning and for being um, poor behavior. But then we would have. Um, Contest in class, and you would go around the class and have to do a snake and do a contest of knowing your multiplication tables. And I won. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and I remember that. And killing my kids when they were in fourth and fifth grade and learning multiplication, you just got to sit down and make the table. That's where the cool kids are sitting. I never get to sit down. <laughs> exactly. The cool kids and me, they let me sit down. <laughs> Mike's here too. That's so that was one thing. I wish they do that today. That's not the way they're learning about it. No, I, remember, I remember those games we played with those. And I, I always enjoyed them. I, just, that was, I mean, going up to speed wheels, I think, is what we call them. Yeah, we used to build the board, you know, yeah. So. It became fun because you knew that exactly. material. Mine was high school. I, did, I had a, a history teacher. In fact, I, I still remember him today. He, uh, he, he just did things differently. You know, he, he, he got us in the heart of it. It's the same thing. It went back to almost like a quiz bowl today. Mm -hmm. yeah. He had built this special thing. That's uh, much like the old pass, you know, password thing. You hit the button on the timer and... And, and it was, it was, he, he just, he, it, he involved us much more than just sit there and more of a lecture, game. actually. Well, it wasn't a lecture, a lecture, a lecture. Because that's where I got lost. If you get a lecture, it's That's how kids stuff. learn. It's more interactive, not just a lecture. Yeah. But there are kids out there that are just Oh, yeah. Well, I was, I was pretty easily distracted. Yeah. My, my oldest daughter has, has some of that too. Right. You know, you can just be sitting in a meeting and all of a sudden, you know, I know you're off on another project here. or something. Exactly. You know, and it, it's it's too much going on. My deal is kind of similar to yours, Mark. The first thing I thought about was uh, Betty Hawkins. She was like a sophomore uh, position teacher. Uh, I don't know. She just made all the writing meaningful to me. And I think it was just how she presented it, but she also would take the time with you and explain, you know, in right. detail, and just seemed to care about me you know, as a person. I always remember her. She's one of my standout teachers. Did you say this to Berkeley? No. Golden Sand. <laughs> Golden what? Golden Sand. Golden Sand Storm. <laughs> I'm not sure how golden it was, but they did have a little more brown. Yeah, a little more brown. So we're talking about all of your profound learning, learning experience. experience. I'm going to give you about one more minute to kind of wrap it up. And we'll, we'll go around and kind of have one person share from each table just briefly what you talked about. I'm a recovering middle school principal. <laughs> And so I don't know that I had a date. It wasn't profound. Oh, yeah, about 10 years, but 14 years, actually. But um, I think when I saw that, I spent a summer in Brazil when I was in college, and I learned the language. And then when I got there, and it started somewhere in the middle, when you throw yourself into a country by yourself and you go into 
missionary to missionary right. or dormitory to dormitory, and you realize if I don't learn this, I can't get to the next spot. <laughs> to my next place. Yeah, that was pretty profound. The most profound, though, was that I studied the culture or prepared myself just to know that it wasn't my culture. Wow. So the culture itself really didn't have a big impact on me as far as culture shock. Mm-hmm. But the urban culture, the country boy from Parker County, I was not prepared for it. When the lady in the building next to us was cleaning the windows and watching our TV on the 22nd floor, I'm like, <laughs> I, I mean, I grew up with no curtains on the windows. Right. And the lady up here is watching our TV. And they really do have jackhammers going at midnight. I'm like, what are you doing? Go to bed. Everything I saw before, this is before I'd been to New York. You know, it's like, you see that on TV and you don't think about it. You're like, you don't really do just talk all the time. Yeah. And I think that was probably the, that was when I got there. Right the let's, let's come back but to the whole now. Let's talk. If I can just have some, one table or two or three, let's kind of go around and talk about some things that made the experience memorable. If you want to give us a, a very brief summary of possibly what the experience I can say, yeah. was, you know, you guys, we can do that. Let's talk. Focus more on that point about what made it memorable. Who wants to jump out there and go first? All right, maybe it's back. You get paid to do this. Well, at our table, uh, Tom and I had a similar story. Um, I was one who was being voted FHA president in my senior year in high school. His was being voted uh, president of the National Honor Honor Society, and I'm getting an opportunity to go to to Boys State. And it was just a matter of taking that moment in our lives at a younger age to get to. And. And being, taking on that much responsibility at a young age and being in charge of, of the students that are our age and having that much faith in adults that they had in us for us to take on the that role. So that was what we experienced. So. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, you talk about the impact of stories that the teacher had. They did something different to make that concept stick with you, not just present the information. So like the mayor mentioned here that uh, you use flashcards. Well, the teacher dropped the flashcards, and so they were out of sequence, so you didn't know whether it was a subtraction, addition, or multiplication, so it's something that kept the mind going. But the story was really key because they attached something to that story. Okay, very good. Thank you. We talked about different um, experiences that we had, but basically, That I got I got set up here. They said it's my job to speak. I thought that's not fair. Uh, ours really involved and in, in, in talked about really elementary, and and it wasn't just uh, you know, lecturing to us. It was those that involved you know the stories with the flashcards. Uh, those were stories we talked about that we remembered. The having to learn the multiplication table. Having we talked about being disciplined when you didn't learn them. Yeah, we can't do that anymore. But those are those are things that that uh, just were that go back to that uh, just memorable positive. It wasn't negative; they were positive, memorable experiences. I just was just thinking about the teachers making a personal interest in our lives, and you know, so whatever grade we're in, and then taking the time. As we mentioned, you know, there are several teachers still still around today that I had when I was in junior high or high school. So still still have contact with my English teacher from, from high school. My it, ain't, it ain't been too long ago. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was doing a great job. All right. Anybody else? 
Okay, yes, ma'am. Okay, in uh, high school calculus, it's time to find the area under a curve, and he could have just easily said, here's the formula, we will now learn the formula. But instead, he took an hour lesson to take us through the process of how they developed the formula. And it's a very tiresome, frustrating experience to show that. And it was memorable because we, we had to do that formula thousands of times throughout calculus. And I would always remember how they developed that formula. So it was just very neat that he took the time to actually show us why they did that. OK, well, I think, obviously, the point of this was, first of all, to get you talking with your group, obviously, and kind of uh, get us going here a little bit, but obviously also to, uh, uh, to talk about those profound learning experience. What makes learning meaningful? And I, and I think many of the things you talked about, we didn't say specifically, but obviously the relationship piece, uh, you made, they made it very practical to you. Uh, they uh, made it applicable. I heard somebody use that term. They made it interesting to you. They brought you into the story. Somebody said they made you feel like you were part of that story. So it's not just standing up and delivering the information and making you <coughs> repeat that back on an exam or to set some type of assessment. It's, it's actually engaging you in the activity to a point, in some cases, probably, uh, because you, you remember today, it wasn't about that grade that you got on that necessarily. Nobody talked about the fact that you got 100, 100 or 90 or anything like that. It was the fact that you probably did it within um, I guess without even thinking about whether you're going to get a grade or not. And that's really, when we talk about engaging students in the classroom, we want them to try to attempt to do the work, to be involved in the work to a point where they want to do it, that, they, that it's meaningful to them, that it engages them in the activity. In fact, many of you have probably seen our, our district mission statement as it, as it is right now, and that is to engage and encourage students and staff every day in meaningful work. That's ultimately our goal, is to engage and encourage our students in meaningful work. We want them to understand the relevance, how practical it is, to a point that they want to learn that. And what we did today, hopefully, was to try to create uh, some content for you today that's meaningful, that will be somewhat engaging to you as we go throughout this process, uh, learning about our curriculum and instruction uh, division. There's our, I've already more or less explained why we focused on curriculum matters. The matters of the curriculum, but the, also the point that yes, what we teach is very important in what we do. The, uh, there's five areas that we're gonna focus on today, and we're gonna go through them very quickly. Uh, the curriculum goes back to what I talked about at the beginning. What it is that we want the students to know and be able to do. That's the content. The instruction piece is how we as teachers deliver that content to them. Uh, how do we know if students are learning it? That question I mentioned at the beginning, that falls into the assessment piece. We'll touch on that briefly today, but next time in April, you will hear a lot more about assessment uh, from a state standpoint, but also from a district standpoint. We feel like that in order for teachers to be successful in planning lessons that are engaging, that are meaningful to students, they have to collaborate with one another. They have to be in collaboration with their principals, but also outside the campus. It's important that we learn from other professionals in order to provide our students the best opportunities. And the last piece of that is professional learning, which is a critical piece. Uh, we have to continue to learn. We're all, everything we do is about learning. And as professionals, as teachers, we have to continue to stay on top of the latest uh, models that are out there, approaches that can best reach our students. Uh, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time at the end, and that's, that falls into Margaret's area, and she'll address, address the professional learning piece. And we feel like that with these five areas, this must be the, this is the engaging piece. It's the, the uh, <laughs> animation that plots into this. It was a little slower than I expected. So I just kind of set the mood and just kind of slow things down a little bit. I know I have a tendency to talk quickly, so it, I think it's there to slow me down. Uh, with those five areas, we feel like that those are the foundation and the building blocks for supporting student success. And that didn't work out. Let's try that again. Should I do it again? <laughs> <laughs> didn't work out. Yeah. Okay, the alignment. We talk about alignment a lot in this district. Uh, there's three areas. Our written curriculum. Our written curriculum basically is provided from the state, which you'll hear a little bit more in detail in just a minute. We have a curriculum for every course uh, that are essential knowledge and skills. That, what, that is what has to be taught in every classroom. Other things fall into that written curriculum. For example, our teachers 
Lesson plans also are the written curriculum. What is it that we are planning to teach in that classroom? That is our written curriculum. The next piece is our taught curriculum. What is actually delivered in that classroom? And it's important because what we write and what's written in those texts, unless we really put some focus on that, may not necessarily be what is taught. We've got to make sure that that's aligned. And there's a lot of things in there that are uh, that sometimes teach that students learn that may or may not have been the intended curriculum as part of that. So we've got to try to control that as much as possible as a teacher to ensure that we are aligned with that written curriculum so that what we're teaching is covered and at the appropriate levels. And we'll talk about that too. And then finally, our tested curriculum. This falls into obviously assessments that we do in the classroom as an instructor, but also. That, that big thing lingering out there, which you'll hear more about, and that is our state assessment. All that has to be aligned. So we have our state curriculum, which is mandated to us. We have our district curriculum, which we make some modifications to. We have our teacher's lesson plans, which all fall into that written, and then what's actually delivered, but then ultimately it has to be aligned with what's tested. And the piece that really tends to throw a little bit of a challenge in there is this, this word cognitive level. Because when you look at those essential knowledge and skills, and you break that down to what it is a student should be able to do, and what the student should know, uh, there's different things in there that determine how that student is going to process that, the level of thinking that must go into that, and so that, that little pin on there goes through all those areas because we have to, it's written, it has to be written at a particular level of understanding for the student. We have to then deliver that at the appropriate level. So for example, if the written curriculum has a student, it says a student is supposed to be able to analyze and apply something, if as a teacher we deliver that in a manner where all they have to do is recall facts. They just have to cite it back. That's not going to be the appropriate level. And then it would not be aligned when we test it. That's very simplistic, but the point is that it has to be consistent through all three of those areas, the written, taught, and tested curriculum. And this is just another, another approach to basically explain the same thing. We have a written, taught, and tested curriculum there at the bottom, and then our objectives are basically the written, our activities is how we instruct, that's our that's our instructional piece, the taught, and then our assessment piece would be the, uh, the tested curriculum. And then the levels, the cognitive levels are what kind of the, the piece that holds all that together to ensure the alignment of the cognitive levels. If it says to apply, we have to teach it at that level. If it's a knowledge and fact piece, we have to teach it at that level. And so that's what holds this all together between the written, taught, and tested. The next piece, and, and there's some, and, and uh, this is really the curriculum, I've touched on this briefly. A lot of this is mandated from the state. We don't have a lot of room for negotiation on what we teach in particular content areas. These are the state standards. These are non-negotiable. These are things that if I'm a classroom teacher, this is what I have to teach. The piece that gives you a little bit of flexibility where our teachers have a little bit of autonomy is the how. And so at this point, we have uh, Ms. Solly, who is our Director of Curriculum Instruction. This is what she and what her department, what they work on uh, on a regular basis. They get down to the, uh, to the very detailed piece of this, looking at student expectations from the state curriculum, providing a curriculum to our teachers, which is accessible by content area, by grade level, uh, with model lessons and things, so that they can look at that as they plan their day. And so she's going to go into this uh, and show you from a teacher's perspective really what it is that they have to go through in order to deliver a lesson on a daily or a weekly basis. So we're going to demonstrate for you at this time, and I'm very thankful that Ms. Solly is going to walk you through this at this time. Thank you. Uh, as you were thinking about that profound learning a while ago, you probably were much like I was as I was preparing for this morning. It, last night I thought, you know, I, don't, I know what my profound learning experience was that I shared at my table. But when I was in the classroom with that teacher or other teachers when I was a student, I really, I know this, and I would probably speak for all of you, I never thought about how hard that my teacher had to work to provide that profound learning experience for me. In this case, it was a male teacher. I just assumed he came out of the teacher closet every morning and stood in front of the room and started teaching. I didn't, you know, I didn't know that. But as I became an educator, I, I learned early on it's not an easy job. And uh, there are many, many things you have to go through. And so this little section of the presentation, I'm going to kind of talk you through that. Dr. Ledbetter has referred to the written curriculum. Uh, he mentioned the text. That is the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. 
And you might hear people call them teaks or tags. I won't argue that point. However, this English teacher really remembers the consonant, vowel consonant, phonemic rule, and I have to say tex. So, But other people say tex, and it's great. So if you hear either one of those, that's kind of the overarching concept that teachers would talk about, and I'll show you an example in a minute, or teachers are expected to deliver. The other thing, that acronym that you'll hear us talk about is SEs. Those are student expectations, and that really drills down to exactly what the student is expected to know and be able to do. And I want you to look um, at, well, this is just a review of that piece. So thinking about those, I'm going to show you a student expectation. It's in two parts. And I want you to read it and then talk with your table partners and think about what you think the targeted grade level is for this student expectation. There are two sections to it. So read it and then discuss it with your shoulder partner what grade level you think it's for. I can't answer because I got the answer yeah. to the question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the fourth grade. John's the third grade. Kind of right there where you're getting mastery over your I don't have a partner on my right shoulder. We're going with uh, <laughs> kindergarten first. Hey. Anybody want to shout out for the grade level thing? Yeah. 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 The teachers, you can't tell because you know. What grade level? What grade level are you talking about? We, we were third or fourth? Third or fourth grade, third or fourth grade here, third grade back there. I wouldn't have answered. Second, third, 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 Okay. The answer is, if this is a second grade student expectation. Now you see that 2.4. Uh, as teachers look at this, they see that too, and they'll immediately say the correct point four is just the fourth uh, expectation drill down. This is the knowledge and skill statement, number, operation, and quantitative reasoning, student models, multiplication, and division. That's pretty straightforward. Then, but if you go back to um, the student expectations, then it's drilled down. Not only are they supposed to understand multiplication and division, but they have to model, create, describe uh, situations in which equivalent sets of concrete objects are joined or separated, depending on if it's multiplication or division. That's the level at which teachers begin their planning. They don't begin their planning at saying, oh, we're going to learn how to multiply. They begin at this level and plan from there. So, Let's look at another student expectation, and because I showed you the trick, it's 2.7, I believe this one is, but on the next slide you'll see the, the, uh, uh, the text printed out there. But I want to look at this student expectation and just point out some training that we did in our district on Monday with teachers so that there's a common uh, language about how to uh, break these down. When a teacher looks at this, they look first at the verb. The verb is, the student is expected to do what? Describe. Describe. Okay. Hang on to that. They're expected to describe. Describe what? Attributes. Very good. Very good. <laughs> they are to describe attributes. Now, this one has a parenthetical phrase in it, but let's skip through that. Attributes of two and three dimensional geometric figures. That's the what. So we know that the verb says we're to describe attributes of those geometric figures in what context? How, how, will we, how will they be expected to do that work? Well, it will be with circles, polygons, spheres, cones, cylinders, prisms, pyramids, etc. Now notice it says such as. That means at a state level or classroom level, the test questions about that particular expectation could cover any of those or others that might be not mentioned in the student expectations specifically. Now, that took us two or three minutes to talk through. There are many, many of these student expectations, and teachers uh, work 
very hard to make sure they covered every one of them. Uh, the curriculum staff, of which I have the privilege to work every day, works very hard to make sure that we have covered every one of these. You can't leave any of them out, because if you do, that creates those learning gaps. So uh, it's not just a matter of coming out of that teacher closet like Neil Duncan did every morning uh, when I was in high school and sharing that profound teaching. I guess he really did work at night. I, didn't, I don't know what he did, but, but I guess he did. So that just kind of gives you a feel for the student expectation and the uh, essential knowledge and skills. Now, once they've looked at those standards, then what do they do? And I'm going to try to do this magical thing here called toggling as I talk. I do. I just need to minimize that so I can <laughs> so I get to where I want to go. I'm so sorry. I can't toggle and talk at the same time. That makes it hard. And we hope that I'm still logged in. If not, I will do that quickly. And I'm not. Okay. When a teacher gets ready to um, to begin work, and Mark, you have to get me to the purple page, but we'll do that. Do you have it on favorites? Probably. This is like Lane's roof going up slowly. All right. Wow. So you're really seeing what teachers do. They go to Curriculum Central Online. If you want to know the acronym, it's CCO, and we uh, say that often because this is where our curriculum is currently housed for teachers. No longer do they have the big binders that sit on the shelves. But now they go, everything is, is online. Uh, they go to the curriculum, and uh, I'm going to pick today secondary math. I could pick any of them. This is uh, our core curriculum, our foreign language or loved curriculum is here, our CTE classes are here, and fine arts curriculum documents are here. And if I am an Algebra One teacher, Pity those children, but if I were that, this would be the website to which I would go and then scroll down to a particular six weeks. We'll just pick the fifth six weeks. And there you notice, you, may, you probably can't see that, but there are two unit maps inside the fifth six weeks algebra one curriculum. That means there's two big units that, that need to be taught during that six weeks time period. Each uh, curriculum content area has unit maps that are similar in appearance to these. And again, I don't know how much of that you'll be able to see closely, but it begins at the top with which six weeks. This particular unit is estimated to take nine days. And then those text statements are identified uh, here by number. This, this is the A.2A tech. And then the student expectation column is written out um, and it tells the teacher the verb and all the content and context clues. This particular document has been revised to our most recent iteration and, and I didn't pick it because of that, but, but this one has been revised. You will see that if you can see this column, this third column is the verb. It identifies for the teachers the verb that they'll be working with, the concept. Uh, when I'm looking at is quadratic parent function, and then context, they'll have to be able to show mastery of that in equations and graphs. So this is an example of what teachers see, and those teachers in the back of the room looking at me going, oh, gosh, didn't look like that. Uh, we are in the process of, of converting to this new template, so some are have this much detail, some do not, but they all have this basic uh, information, and then if we scroll down through the document, the key concepts and understandings are there. Academic vocabulary is there for that lesson. And then there are some resources. Uh, the, typically, it's the adopted textbook. And then there'll be some other resources, links to uh, YouTube videos that might be the work with the lesson, uh, other uh, resources that the teachers might choose to use. This is that autonomy part where we are going to say, you have to teach this curriculum, and you have to teach it at this granular level, but you have some autonomy about how to deliver it. And uh, 
we don't walk in lockstep yet with scripted text uh, or scripted lessons in, in many of our courses, but, but we are pretty close to that, but still teachers can do what they want uh, in the classroom as long as they are meeting the standards. And then there are some assessment um, suggestions in this part of the unit map. Everything from some formative on the fly, as I walk around the room kind of assessments, to uh, a summative assessment. And then in this particular one, they have some common assessments because our Algebra One teachers across the district have been creating some common assessments to help them as they prepare their students for the end of course exams. Uh, and then again, just a reiteration of the Texas Knowledge and Skills. And then college and career readiness standards must be considered for planning lessons. Uh, also, English language proficiency standards have to be included in the planning. Now, this is one unit map for one course. Uh, think about elementary teachers who teach in self-contained classes where they teach five or six subjects, and they go to these unit maps for each of that planning. It's no wonder that Angie looks tired back there because she's, she does teach elementary, Carrie does also, uh, and so, but it is, it is not just that simple piece of, oh, I'm going to teach school, and you get up and teach, and, and I know you know that, but we wanted you to see today in verbal what it looks like for teachers on a daily uh, basis as they go into and plan and design the delivery of instruction for our students. Um, Now, that is the taught curriculum, and we have great teachers in our district who teach that, and I, I want to say again, it is the work of the curriculum staff to provide this measure of work for them. They, they, uh, if, if they ever, if any of the consultants came to me and said, I'm finished with the curriculum, I'd probably laugh, but then I would say, okay, start over, uh, because it is a never-ending process. It will never be completed, because it's always in a state of revision, Addition, and, and the staff that works with me is great at doing that, providing support to teachers and involving teachers. I will say that in our district, we do an excellent job of getting teacher input about what goes into those unit maps. We are, we are knowledgeable about the content areas, but we're not always the expert about the delivery, and so we want to get those closest to the kids to give us input about that. And so that is the what, that's the curriculum, and this is the how, the talk curriculum. Once we've done all that, we do have to see what they've learned, and that goes into the assessment part, and I believe Dr. Ledbetter is going to share that with you. Okay. Okay, here we go. All right. So we've talked about the written and the taught, and now we're moving into the, uh, the assessment piece. I'm not going to spend much time. There's only two or three slides on this. Uh, I do want to go back and just reiterate what Donna just said. The, uh, the point of this today was not to overwhelm you with, and with a lot of essays and texts and different verbiage that uh, may or may not remain with you uh, after today. But the point is uh, that there's a lot that goes into planning a lesson, to delivering that, uh, to meeting the expectations that are, that are handed down to us from the state level. Uh, but, but ultimately, our ultimate goal is that student success piece, the student achievement piece. And the only way that we can determine if we are effective, uh, if we're uh, reaching our goal, uh, is, and going back to that original question, how do we know if they learned it, uh, is to assess. And a lot of times we think of assessment being the STAR test, or the ELC, or TAX, or TABS, or TEAMS, or whatever it is that you're familiar with, all those state accountability, state assessments. But in reality, the assessments that take place in the classroom are much more meaningful uh, in terms of learning uh, than what we get from a state accountability standpoint, from that one day, that one snapshot, at one time, whether or not a student is successful or not. Uh, it's what goes on in that classroom. That's ultimately how we determine that. So we, we look at assessment, uh, trying to transition, obviously in the past, you know, you, you assess to see if students are learning. You give them a grade. They made 9, they made 88, they failed it, so they didn't learn. But really, ultimately, that assessment should be to determine, are they learning? 
So an assessment for learning. So it helps us to make decisions, to enhance our curriculum, to guide us. It's not a one-time, you know, at the end of that unit we give a test, and that's how much you learn, and we move on to the next unit. As instructors, as teachers, we're assessing as we go along. It may not always be a multiple-choice test. It may not be something that we hand out. It can be formal or informal. It can be questions in the classroom. We are continually assessing. You have formative assessments, which are those that inform your instruction, help you to make decisions. And so that's ultimately that, that bottom piece there, and this is from Rick Stiggins, uh, that we are trying to assess for learning. We assess in order to ensure that our students are learning what we want them to, that they, they are able to do and to know what we want them to at the end of the unit, at the end of the year, or whatever the case may be. Uh, we have some things that are in place at the district level for assessments. Well, these are some of the things that go into uh, planning an assessment in the classroom. And once again, I mentioned it can be formal, informal. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a paper and pencil test, but these are the things that would go into planning that, making that decision. Uh, at the district level, we, we provide some what we call benchmark assessments in the past. Some of you are familiar with that term. This year, we've been calling them snapshots. There's various reasons for doing this. Uh, we have a couple of different versions that we that we utilize. We have snapshots that will that we give to district level written by our consultants uh, to monitor the implementation of our curriculum, and basically that is to inform us at the district level as to where we are in the curriculum. Is it sufficient? Is the timing correct? Uh, are the learning are the, is the learning that we intended appropriate? Um, is the teaching that's taking place at the level that it needs to be? So in some cases, it can inform us if there's areas that perhaps we need to address at the district level as a principal, uh, as a campus, whatever the case may be, certain things going on there, and then also from a program standpoint. Uh, if we give these benchmark assessments, uh, and there's certain areas, perhaps our advanced academics or our reading intervention programs, those types of things, if they're not at the level we need them to be, then that provides us valuable data to go in and make decisions about those programs. And so we have multiple reasons for that. Some of them are also, in the past, many of your students, some of you have actually administered these, uh, they've been released tax types te tests. And those are really to be predictors of student success on those assessments. Do they have the knowledge, skills, have they gained the knowledge and particular objectives to do, to perform adequately on that tax or on the STAR or on the EOC as we move forward. So we have a couple of different, different purposes for those district benchmarks. Some are to monitor curriculum implementation, others are to predict success on tax or STAR. We also have, moving into, uh, with Dr. Brown's leadership and, and the direction that we're going, really trying to work on common assessments on campuses. So not necessarily just at the district level, but also moving into where all the eyes were one teachers on a particular campus would give a common unit assessment so that they can then look at uh, areas of strength, weaknesses of students, but also of teachers. If I'm, if a particular teacher taught a concept and her students perform much better, then you can have conversations within that collaborative piece, professional learning community, to make decisions about how I'm instructing. So it's, it's all for information so that we can ultimately increase student learning. So those are kind of some things from an assessment standpoint that we do at the district level and, and then what we try to do uh, at the campus level as well. And then like we've, we've talked about a couple times, next, uh, our next session you will get into probably more information than you ever wanted about state accountability, uh, standards, and then also some more about our, our district assessments that are taking place. Ultimately, the bottom line is we want to know that the students get it, and that's why we assess. And it helps to inform our instruction. Obviously, the, the next piece that I think is vitally important uh, is that our teachers, that we provide quality professional learning to them to help them grow uh, so that they continue to stay on top of their game, so that they can provide the best opportunities for students. Um, obviously, in our district, it's professional learning. Some of you may even hear the term staff development. It's basically how our teachers grow and learn, how we keep them up to date on what's out there, the latest trends, et cetera. So our, our director of professional learning, Margaret Miller, will take you through the next two or three slides and talk to you a little bit about professional learning and how we encourage our teachers to collaborate as they design lessons. Thank you, Lynn. Good morning. It is my delight to end my career this year as Director of Professional Learning. Um, for those of you who've been around a long time, I started in this district as a young, brand new teacher on the corner of Carson and Belknap in what was then Halton High School as a teacher. And I'm going to end my career right there in that same building, even though 
I have followed my husband from New Jersey to California and various sites in between and have returned here, I'm pretty much sure that it's divine destiny that I began and ended my career here. And so I'm very happy today and passionate still about the work I get to do with the teachers in verbal. One of my true joys every year is the fact that I get to work with the brand new teachers who've never taught a class. And we hire the best in Texas. We are fortunate, thanks to our board, to be able to pay our new teachers well based on the standards in this state. And we hired the best there is. We attract the best candidates and then we hire the best of the best. So it's my privilege every year to know sincerely that we are upgrading our teaching staff. And therefore, I'm really aware that professional learning for them is important. And here's why. I have a professional learning advisory team who represent teachers, central office, campus leadership, um, support staff, and we meet regularly to make sure that the decisions we make about the learning we're designing for professionals in Berkeley will really help them do their jobs well and will really help them meet the needs of students. That's our number one goal. So let's look at some of the reasons the professional learning advisory team has agreed upon make professional learning important. First of all, every student learns when every educator engages in effective professional learning. Well, if that's true, then we want to be sure that every educator does engage in that. That too follows our mission that we not only engage and encourage students every day in meaningful work, but we engage and encourage staff every day in meaningful work. The second of the third basic premises behind why do we need professional learning is this one, and that is that remarkable professional learning begins with ambitious goals for students. So we don't start with what do we need as teachers or professionals, but what do students need? If that's what they need, what do we need to learn or do to make sure that they have their needs met? And then finally, the third one is that students learn, students learning increases when educators reflect on professional practices and student progress. So this gives a clue to how we proceed. We look at student performance data and ask ourselves, what do these data tell us that students need? And therefore, what do these data indicate validate a need for change? If that's what students need, what do we need to know or do differently to help them get their needs met? I'd like for you, for a second, if you would, to talk about this at your table, maybe one minute, two minutes, something. Why is it that when you collaborate with your colleagues in your work, your work improves? Could you just comment about collaborating with colleagues in your work, whatever that work is? I think everybody brings something different to the table with a different perspective. We all have blind spots. Oftentimes, it's, uh, it's revealing to visit with them. You kind of have one of those calm moments, Mark, and, you know, and, and yeah, we can, we can do that. And make, make a simple adjustment and get, get better at home. Well, it's also sharing the load, particularly among teachers. Let's say four or four grade teachers in the school. If I have to think about every little thing and come up with every little activity, or because you do that one activity one time in your classroom, and then you've done that for that. Now you're still learning, but if it's a very specific activity, okay, we're done. So next year I'll do it better. Because you've had four people that have had that experience. You know, we don't pass this out till the end. We don't pass it. Oh, which makes a huge difference in. In those aha moments, sometimes sometimes it just makes a huge difference in you not losing your mind. <laughs> you know, like they went nuts because we had you know, whatever we had. So. Little simple tweaks that make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and that's the thing that, that you see is you know, we try to train teachers on that too. Is think about that process and how that's going to help. You know, because you want for you to be out of the box. And you got to be out of the box, and so there's some risk there. But if everybody comes and says, you know what works for me, or you know what we could do, 
Because again, what you said, those different angles. Because mm -hmm. we, we have a certain way to do everything. It's good or bad, they have a certain way to do yeah. Yeah. yeah, every human being. Uh, and I, that's what I've, I've seen as far as, you know, teachers really bringing that to the table. And uh, we've gotten a lot better about collaborating, I think, because we're making these kids do it. And the kids all work in groups, they live in groups. You know, we said, uh, you know, they don't... Very great collaboration stories, and my guess is that every 30 minutes, you can continue the conversation and still have everyone to tell. Just in the sake of time, could I ask you to postpone that conversation to your later break, and you can talk more about collaborating. Let me just ask a few general questions about what you just heard at your table. How many of you heard someone at your table say, I learned from my colleagues about ways to do their work that I can apply to my work? How many of you heard that at your table? How many of you heard, I learned content I learn about a resource or something that I could use in my work from my colleagues. Let me ask this general question. How many of you collaborate regularly? It's scheduled. It's on your calendar. That's important, too. Okay. Well, all I want you to know is that verbal ISD is right in line with business organizations because we also build in collaboration. We know that teachers working in isolation cannot, will not, do as fine a job as teachers working collaboratively. So we build in lots of things to support the collaboration. And as Donna mentioned, that teacher closet, we don't want them going in there and having to do all the hard work alone, but rather to enhance each other by meeting together in collaborative teams. So we have lots of different district committees and teams. I mentioned my advisory team, Donna can talk about textbook adoption collaboration that teachers get together to talk about which resources we need to adopt that would be best for students. There are all kinds of those. We also have established in verbal, and particularly this year with Dr. Brown's leadership, an establishment of professional learning communities on every campus so that teachers can work together in their grade level teams, their content area teams, to look at student data, to design lessons, to plan common assessments, to set goals for student learning, and to track and monitor that learning by collecting assessment data. So there is a systematic and systemic focus on collaboration in verbal ISD through the professional learning communities. And we've been working on that. Donna could also talk to you about how her content area consultants in supporting all the curriculum matters, do Wednesday walkthroughs. They actually go out into classes to see where the teachers are in terms of teaching the curriculum, to observe how students are engaged in their learning. And so they're collecting data on that type of teaching and learning, and we therefore think that that collaboration among professionals at the central office level will help. I think so. I think we're good. Question? Yes, ma'am. Okay, this may back up just a second. As far as the tools that you use to get all of the teachers together, or some of those are going to be where it's just the staff development days and things like that, are you using any of the technology tools? Like the big one we use at work, and a lot of people use is GoToMe, to where you're, not, you're able to connect those campuses through the webinars and conference calls, so they're able to have a quick 30 minute to get that information together, you can set it up as reoccurring. Are you using any of those type of resources right now with the teachers? We are, and we have just um, purchased other ways of doing that too that we will be using more and more. I don't know that we've mentioned that we have um, instructional technology specialists who at one time in our district were part of the technology division. We have married them to the curriculum instruction so that as the content area consultants make plans, they have a side-by-side -side partner who's an expert in using technology to help students learn at high levels so that in every lesson, technology is not some little ripple effect or some little free fruit tacked on top. Well, let's let them make a PowerPoint. No, it is part of the building of the engagement of the lesson because we know that students today are innate learners through technology. 
And it's a, a learning tool, not something to be added on top. So I would just say, yes, it's part of the natural process. I didn't do this little slide. That's OK. They were kind of stuck on the PowerPoint. Uh, I also want you to know that every year we apply through TEA for some waiver days to be designated as days for professional learning for teachers. And it's quite a, uh, an intense process. But once we're granted that, then we make sure that those days are quality. Sometimes they are dedicated to campus days so that the principals can help design what works best for their student population, their needs, their campus. Sometimes they're district initiative days. And in the past, we've worked on such things as strategies for continuous improvement, how to look at data, how to set goals, how to track and monitor progress how to work collaboratively as we do all those things. We also, um, on those days, make sure that teachers have resources in their content area or their grade level or whatever, and that we focus on what we're all about, and that is teaching what kids need to learn and making sure they do that. Just to very quickly go back to your question up here about the, the other alternative approaches to trying to provide professional learning for teachers. We've done some things, like Margaret mentioned, kind of sporadic. We don't have a necessarily a system-wide approach uh, for doing that. And I think with Mr. Summerall's leadership, you know, he's mentioned briefly some opportunities and different methods out there possibly to do that. So I think in the future, we will utilize those tools. But as you know, obviously technology changes rapidly, so access to those tools, uh, training for those tools and then obviously with 1,500 teachers and many campuses trying to, to find one that we really want to focus on and utilize. We've had, I know Tracy Bestgrove is here. She, uh, she's done some things with our advanced academics consult our uh, specialists across the district, uh, online talk things where she had, she's led some meetings and professional learning with them through that, through, those, through the technology piece of it. But as far as, and we've done obviously we Skyped in some consultants and done some things like that from outside that, that have been beneficial for our teachers. But having a a district-wide approach to that, focused on one area, and that we do on a regular basis. It's it's been you know a little bit somewhat sporadic, so I think we'll probably have a little bit better approach to that uh, in the future. So uh, just to just to kind of quickly summarize, obviously what we've touched on today fall into these three areas: curriculum, instruction, and assessment. The what we teach, uh, how we deliver that, and then how do we know if they learn what we what we what we intended? Curriculum, instruction, and assessment, and uh, the. Uh, the district vision is all students succeed in the future they create. We talked about the mission at the beginning. We want to engage and encourage, encourage, encourage students in meaningful work. We also want to engage and encourage staff, and we try to keep both those things in mind. We want our teachers to understand that what we provide from a professional learning standpoint hopefully is relevant, it's meaningful to them, but ultimately we also want to provide the same type of experience to our students. The piece in there about the future they create is basically giving them ownership in the learning. Uh, in order for it to be engaging and relevant to students, uh, we want it to be meaningful for them. We want them to have some ownership in what they're doing, utilizing technology, the things that they're interested in, making it relevant for them. And that's really the, where our, our vision comes from. It's that student ownership piece. And this goes back to the question that I mentioned at the very beginning. And uh, I said that much more simply than this is written up there. But it's, you know, what do we expect students to know and be able to do? How do we know? If they're learning it, what do we do if they don't? I mean, that's the very basis of, of what we try to try to do. The uh, next session, which I've mentioned a couple times, will be on state accountability, state testing, assessment. Mr. David Holland will be here. He's our director of assessment and accountability. He's going to lean in and talk to you about our changing system of accountability, uh, which is our STAR test, which I know many of you uh, have heard about. I just want to finish today, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Very formal. Hopefully, you have some questions for, uh, for Margaret and Donna. Uh, and we'll be glad to answer anything that you want to ask. But I want you to take just a minute or two uh, to work through, just to kind of lead in the next session. Think about these questions. Uh, think about perhaps what the answer might be. And think about what grade level you might expect to see a question like. And you can't talk with those of you. <laughs>
I won't call it your individual hair. Talk amongst yourselves. That's a third grade question. I'm thinking like third grade, just third, equation. Four, four yeah. Got to write it out. If you remember who wants to be a millionaire, you can't call a friend. Or... <laughs> 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 yeah. Sorry, I know the answer, so I can't. <laughs> Come just on. always brag. Give us a hint. <laughs> third grade. Third grade. So what's the answer? I think 29. Okay, I'll make it a little bit more simple for you. I'm going to give you four choices. Did you do that in your hand? Or did you already have it? Nah. You flipped over. I did, but I took some time to do it. There's, we didn't build the milk pantries in here. <laughs> I laugh about that. Okay, if you said the answer was A, would you please stand? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'll go ahead and show you the answer. And the answer was D. Uh, what grade do you think this is? Third. Third. Is this solid? This is actually a fifth grade question. No kidding. Wow. Fifth grade question. So I said no problem. Simple. It's fine. Right. Good grade. One more question. Work through this one. A little bit more difficult. Can you translate? The price of the item? Yeah. That's what I think. B. Mark, are we ready? If you're phoning a friend. <laughs> <laughs> no? Staples last night, real late, and they were closing down. And they had a scale. Got the, the manager had a scale, and he was taking all the dollar bills and throwing them on the scale. And it told him how much money he had. He pulled that off and he put. Count. All right, everybody ready, everybody ready for the answer? How many of you said A? They do rolls of quarters. Any B's? C? D? We have a few. All of them. This, had a pin All right. this was this this one was probably a little bit of a giveaway when we said EOC and of course the only grade level taking our end of course this year uh, is our ninth grade. So this was the ninth grade of my math. So that's a little tricky. Well, they, they're, being, they're studying. This just gives you a little quantity. bit of a sample right. of what our students will be faced with this year, beginning this year. I will tell you that next month, next session, Mr. Holland will kind of show you a little bit of, a, of an example of how we have transitioned from tabs to teams to tax to toss to whatever other assessments have been out there and how the rigor or the level of, of uh, knowledge for students and skills has changed over time with respect to expectations. It's interesting to see what we expected of our exit level students 15 or 20 years ago compared to what we expect of our exit level students now. Uh, it's pretty, it, it's tremendous to see the difference, and so he'll talk about that next time as well. Um, as far as the formal part of the presentation, uh, we're done. Uh, I do want to thank Margaret and Donna for their part in this. Obviously, they had so much to do with putting this together and, and uh, putting the content together, and obviously their work uh, is tremendous with what they do with our teachers, uh, with our consultants. Uh, I did, I mentioned Tracy Bestro. She's here as part of our curriculum instruction team as well. She's our advanced academics consultant, working with all our uh, AP and our gifted and talented students across the district and works with her. She has specialists on each campus, so we appreciate her. She's a part of this group, but also 
our focus being curriculum instruction today, I also wanted to introduce her uh, today as well. So uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Brown, but also open it up at this point, either he or I or Margaret or Donna or anybody would be interested in hearing any comments or answering any questions that you might have. So thank you. Well, let's, uh, let's thank uh, these folks here for the for The email might be good. I think you can see that my state's in, in good hands with the knowledge leadership the might provide. But yeah, let's, let's take a few questions. Okay. Now, we've talked a lot about the assessment of the student. What about the assessment of the teacher? And how do you maintain the quality and how do you get rid of one that's not good? Well, um, monitoring and accountability uh, is really becoming very important. And, and what you need to do is if, if you really are doing your job and looking at what the purpose is uh, of education, and if you're really looking at student data, and you're really looking at how successful we're being, then we're not just looking at, well, you know, she's been here a long time, she's a long time, she's department chair, obviously she's good. You, you don't get that quality. Um, you, know, you, you have to earn that, and the way you earn it is looking at how well we do our job. And unfortunately for some school districts across the state, the nation, we've just not been looking closely enough at the value that's being added. But when you start looking at growth, and you start looking at data that really shows that, oh my God, here's where the student was, here's where they are now, and you start looking at the cause of that and monitoring that uh, on, a, on a better basis than we've been doing, then you can determine, oh my gosh, this is really working here. What are you doing that's doing that? And you start having those conversations with teachers that aren't as pleasant, that says, wow, you know, we just didn't make the growth here. Let's, you have to reflect and look back at what you're doing. What you're doing is not working. And it's really no different than you would do if you say, wow, I'm going to change my diet and I'm going to start exercising. Well, if you evaluate over weeks and months and you're not losing weight and I'm punishing myself by not eating the things I want to eat, I'm going to do something different. Or either that, I'm just going to go back to eating what I want because this is not working. And I think that's the change for some people is that rather than just, I'm a math teacher, what do you do? I teach math good, you check it off, and I walk in and the kids look like they're engaged. But it's, it's much different than that. What are they engaged in? And now, what evidence do you have that they're learning what they need to learn? Because that's the next level. That's the walkthroughs. That's the conversation. That's the collaboration. That's the accountability that, that's in place. Because it used to be compulsory attendance in education. Now it's compulsory learning. And I think that's a good thing. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the accountability system exactly in the form that it sits in, because I think it does go a little overboard, but I'm glad there's accountability, because now it allows us to have conversations with people, because this is a paid profession. And when you volunteer, if you had any value, it's great. If you don't, thank you for coming. But we're, we're paid. We're paid to do this. So my view is you have to do it well, and, and you have to have value. So to get rid of the teacher, what you need to do is, first of all, set them up for success, give them the things that they need, support them, with the professional learning and make it a positive experience. And then when you have ample evidence uh, through collaboration and through methodologies that says you've had an ample opportunity to be successful, then you just have to have evidence and documentation that shows here's who you are, here's where you need to be, here's the things we're going to do together to get you to this point. And it's all about how successful your students have been. So I wonder what you're doing is what are the kids able to do as a result of what you've done. So it's a, it's a very complex process. But it's one we're committed to, to doing. So, other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question, just have a comment. And I think that being on the city council, we realized, we started us in the last year, probably the maybe before, but how important education is, not just for our citizens, you know, for children, because it's a part of economic development. That's why I'm calling the city. We've opened the new TCC Center, and it's booming. I think people, are really thinking education and we're really looking at it, even on a city level, saying our citizens, we need you know the best of education to make our cities grow. And last week I was at a lunch in Fort Worth and it was a senior citizen appreciation, a Tarrant County wide thing. And Betsy Price, the mayor of Fort Worth, was a speaker. And I thought it was so interesting because we've just been doing all this in Hawthorne City and seeing our citizens really liking getting, you know, more education. And TCC works with, they're working with Halton Middle Schools and things, and just doing all sorts of stuff. And she said, as the city, we need to be thinking more about education. 
we are young stars and initiatives. Right? We are not school board, but we realize how important education is to our economic development of our city. I thought, wow. You know? And afterwards, I talked to her a little bit, and she said, yes. And I told her, you know, in the whole city, we've been, you know, we've seen it too. We realize it's a part of our economic development for our citizens, their children. To, education is so important. So I think we're going to see that that people are, are really getting interested in education and not just letting it be taken care of by the school district or the school board. I think we're going to see that on the different city levels. Well, you're right. I mean, it controls economic development. If you don't have an effective school system, you probably don't have significant growth. Uh, an area that people can choose from is going to migrate to a more effective system. So uh, our jobs are very, very important to do that. And it just has to do with, with looking at it at a global level. But you've got to really narrow it down. It's student by student, teacher by teacher, uh, principal by principal. <coughs> and you've got to really be a great leader as a teacher. You've got to be able to reach kids. Because that's what we remember. If you think about the, the favorite two, three, four teacher, it's going to be about the relationships. It's going to be about that they cared about you. Uh, they made it fun and exciting and things. It will it'll vary. It will always be a relationship. It's, it's going to be that, that connection. And that's what teachers have to be able to do. Uh, if you can't get, as a principal, as a superintendent, as a teacher, if you can't get those in which you're trying to lead to be want to be led by you, then, then you're not going to, your effectiveness is very limited. So you've got to engage those kids. They've got to know you care about them first and that they can handle some discipline. Kids want that, whether we believe it or not. They do. They want that structure. They may fight against it, but they'll rebel more when they know it's not there. So, other questions? Yes. The standards that, that y'all are showing on the on that website. Yeah. Is there a way for you know for parents or people in the community to be able to see those kind of things? So that, you know, I can okay, yeah, this six weeks my children should be learning this, so I can reinforce it with it, with you know with, with something else that maybe you know that I know and that, that I know that they know. You know what I mean? Right. Is there, is there some way that we can see this? I know it's probably out there on the state site somewhere, but. Kind of and then we have you know, access to grades, attendance, and on. We have a, a way to address that. Yes, the particular <laughs> curriculum uh, site that I showed you is secure because there's some proprietary things and secure test items. But uh, I believe, and I was trying to pull it up on my phone, but I believe uh, we have what we call a flip book that just by course it gives the six weeks what's to be taught during that six weeks. I believe that is on the uh, family page of the district website. If not, we can have it moved to that. Also, teachers are encouraged to, and in some cases expected, and that may be an expectation for next year, to post on their own websites uh, what the learning is for the six weeks. So, I um, mean, you can have that access in addition to the TEA website, as you mentioned. But uh, if that flip book is not on the staff side, I, I think, I mean, on the parent side, I think we moved it to there. If it's not, we will, we can get that moved so you can see by six weeks the basic content. We just looking at that, that question was there. You can see that the answer choice wasn't an answer. You know, math questions used to be an answer to the numbers, and now it's conceptual. We're no longer dispensers of knowledge, but that question we're trying to get people to understand that, that the amount of sales tax you pay is dependent upon the price of the item. And that makes sense to us, doesn't it? When you pay more sales tax when not more expenses, it makes sense, right? But it's just a conceptual thing. That's what they had to get. It's what's dependent upon what. Well, the amount of sales tax you pay is dependent upon the, not the, you know, the rate, but the rate was already set. It was standard there. So the only thing that varies is the, is the independent variable, independent variable. Again, it's not a number. You want to do math. You have to think conceptually. You've got to be able to read. You've got to be able to be a problem solver, be a creative thinker, be innovative. Why? Because we're trying to, trying to prepare kids for jobs that haven't been created yet. How do you do that? I'm not dispensing knowledge. I'm not showing you how to build a house because I have no idea what a house is going to be constructed of in 30 years. And that's what our kindergarten kids are at the prime of their life and 35 years old. And that's 30 years from now, much less when they're 55. So we, we can't begin to prepare them for things that we don't understand. What technology is going to be available? Isn't that scary and frightening? I was involved in a webinar yesterday with five other superintendents. We spent 45 minutes talking about ways that we accomplish different things. So that those things are becoming available, and I never left my office. So there's different things available, and our kids embrace that. They are multitaskers much better than we are. So last question or two. 
Yes, sir. Um, in, in our groups, we talked about how <coughs> teachers who are passionate about us and the subject made a difference. You just stated that, you know, that's where we have to start. The kid has to know we care before we raise an expectation. Um, many of us have been involved, and I appreciate the BISD emphasis on, okay, let's get to know the kids in the changing family because our demographics change across society. And and so is it a stated goal? I see all the professional learning things that are, how do we help the kid learn? How do we help the kid learn? But will it remain a steady, I guess, to educate teachers and admins on changing family, uh, changing demographics? That's some of the angst I feel in the district is teachers are, especially veterans, going, these kids are different than they were 20 years ago, and I don't know how to reach them. And guess what? The parents don't like us anymore. We're not heroes. Um, or is that going to be a continual thing for the district to say, hey, these kids are different. We know you got to give them all these learning outcomes, but professionally, we're going to help you walk this changing psychosocial issue with these kids. I mean, that's... Well, you hit upon a very important point, and that's you've got to understand, first of all, um, the customers that are coming to you. And that has been a very, um, started out slow, but very rapid, now exponential change in that. Some of our schools look very, very different with the needs of our children and the cultures of the families that, that come. So you, we, we do have to do a better job, I think, of engaging with that. And I think at the campus level, they would probably teach us some things about what they and they have to deal with on a regular basis. So as school board members, as members of the cabinet, that's the reason on Thursday I'm out in schools talking to principals in classrooms, you know, getting a look at things because if you don't do that, you lose touch. So you hit upon a very important point is that it's all about the customers. We talk a lot about variation, and there's random variation, which is not good. There's purposeful variation that is good. It's an important decision. So we're not saying everything has to look the same in many areas. But you would expect that an hour for one curriculum might be consistent with your Hawking, Ritzwin, or Berkeley, correct? What kids have to know and be able to do. How you get them there and where you start and the method that you engage kids varies from campus to campus in classroom, classroom, kid by kid. That's the challenging part. Differentiate instruction based on the needs of the kids, where they come to you. Because think about a child that comes to you from another country that's maybe had gifts, you know, just gaps in their education period. They're nine years old and they're two grade level behind. Uh, and they're struggling to learn the language. See, that's a different scenario than someone that started out in kindergarten and has resources. And so that's the challenge of the teacher. Uh, there's a lot that, that goes into in the classroom for the children. So, great point. Yes, sir. If I may, Dr. Brown, um, to speak to that question, I was given the opportunity, <clears throat> my husband Robert Contreras, I'm a fourth grade by legal teacher at the Academy of West, and I was given the opportunity to summer to attend an Eric Jensen conference, yes. which specifically spoke about uh, teaching with poverty in mind. That has given me and my campus and some of my colleagues the opportunity to, um, to address some of the very pertinent and specific um, differences uh, our learners, our customers, are to us. Um, so, so with that said, just to personally speak, to say that we have been given that, that opportunity. Uh, four of us that attended, two administrators, specialists, and two teachers, um, that have helped us also to communicate that information to our campus um, to make our students more successful in, uh, and meet them right at their need based on all the differences and the changes in the environment. Well, and thank you for that. I'm confident if, if we do a good job of asking our, our teachers, there's going to be places where we've not done what he suggested, so that, that's going to be our challenge and our charge to make sure that we're doing that. So I'm glad to hear you know, that's happening. We're, we're, so that's something I'm, I'm looking at. So this summer's professional learning, those opportunities is very important. But we've got to turn to our teachers and ask them, what is it that you need? We can't you know, presume to know what they need in all cases. There's certainly some things we know. We've got to turn to our students and ask them, if you really want to know how you're doing as an educator, ask a 17 year old. They'll tell you. Be, be prepared, though, because they'll tell you the truth. They do some good things, but they'll let you know who they like, what turns them on, what turns them off. So uh, I will meet with uh, high school students from each high school in May, uh, just in a closed room, and ask them very point blank questions and say, Superintendent of School, what do I need to know? And you know, we won't be talking about specific teacher or those kind of things, but we'll be talking about characteristics, attributes. I will then ask them to go meet with their principal and have those conversations about individual teachers. 
a lot is going to be Ms. Ms. Stacy, she rocks. She is awesome. She does this. You can see those, those common attributes of those teachers that rock. And then they're going to say, well, this turns me off. We can't room, we talk, you know, we're just turned off by that. We'll pull out our phones and do whatever. So we're going to listen to that because they're a customer. And they will, they will tell us. One more question. Any other question? We'll take one more if there's one out there. Is that it? Well, thank you for your attention, uh, for your attendance, sir. We appreciate the opportunity. I, I do hope you make every effort to, to come back in April. That's a very important piece. The Star EOC it is the transition. Uh, it is very, very dangerous. If you're worried about teaching to the test, we have a business yeah. called Strong Fathers, and we do father involvement programs in schools. And we have right now about 10 campuses. I just have two quick things. The question on the Bill. We'll add that up because I couldn't find it. Okay, we'll add it to the family page under quick links today. So we'll make that easier for you to find as a parent. And then if you'll just leave your name, tents and your badges for us, we'll have those for next time. And we'll see you on April the 11th. Thank you all. Yeah, across all the grades. Across all the